Welcome to the uh, webinar on MSCs and exosomes slash EVs therapeutics. We're just going to wait a few minutes uh, for other attendees. The number of attendees is going up uh, as I'm speaking. So we're just going to give a few minutes before I start. Okay, I uh, waited a couple of minutes. Uh, there's a few more coming in right now. <clears throat> One of the, uh, I, I will start. Thank you for um, attending this webinar. We welcome you to it. I'm excited to host this event um, because I think it could be relevant to the future direction of islet transplantation. Our speaker, Kevin Hickok, has extensive experience in this field. He's worked at a number of firms, uh, both from the cellular side and the exosome side. So he's an expert in this area. Uh, the relevance of this topic to islet transplant can be just seen looking at the number of hits on um, Google Scholar. If you just do a Google Scholar search uncheck citations and patents and just put the search terms islet transplant and msc you get 14,800 hits when you i went start going through them and the relevant hits if i just restrict that search to 2018 to 2023 last five years there's 62 6,270 hits um, interesting that if you do a similar search on clinicaltrials.gov, there's only been five clinical trials and, um, one has been done it, it, in Charleston, South Carolina, which I'm assuming it's, um, Medical University of South Carolina using it, co-transplantation for total pancreatectomy, island auto transplant is three in China and one Iran. So um, there, even though there's strong research interest, there has been a lot of clinical trial work on this subject. So before we get started, I wanted to um, give you a, a nice little summary that uh, was written in an article from the Edmonton group, Gamble, Pepper, Bruni, and Shapiro, which states, MSCs can migrate to sites of injury and release paracrine factors that regulate local inflammation and may promote revascularization and repair at the transient site. The goal of the webinar is to educate you and also me on this in interesting topic. A few ground rules before we get started. I hand it over to Kevin. Um, you can ask questions via the chat button that you see on the right side of the screen and they'll be answered at the end. Um, I, we encourage you to complete these three polls that will be um, uh, present during the, uh, the webinar, one at the beginning and two others during the course of the meeting. So without any further ado, Kevin, take it away. Hey, good morning, everyone. Thanks a lot, Bob, for having me. Um, and uh, I'm excited to share with you some of my perspectives from the last 30 years of being in the MSC field. Um, this has been an amazing uh, period of time where we've seen incredible advances in, in 
technology and therapeutic development. Um, but there's been some hiccups along the way. And I think over the years, it's easy for all of us to get buried in the latest advances and, and new techniques. But sometimes it's valuable to step back and think about where it all started from and how we got to where we are today and what we can do to improve for the future. So that's the level of uh, thought that I'm going to uh, convey to you this morning, hope, hopefully, and give you uh, some oversight as to where we came from, uh, where we stand, and where we're going to go. Okay, uh, just to start off, I'm currently consulting, uh, but I'm also hopefully working to be a co-founder and a chief science officer of a stealth startup in the, in the regenerative space. Um, the perspectives and opinions that I'm gonna share in this webinar are my own. They're not meant to represent any of those from my current or previous employers um, or, or my colleagues or the sponsor of this webinar. So way back in the late 60s to uh, 80s, uh, there was a, an explosion of research and discovery centered around hematopoietic stem cell transplantation and bone marrow transplantation. And uh, during that period of time, the bone biologists uh, were very excited to understand how hematopoietic cell uh, differentiation occurred within the bone marrow. And there was a group led by uh, uh, Professor Friedenstein and, and Marie Nolan, and uh, they did a lot of the seminal work on understanding what these supportive cells within the bone marrow were, which they referred to as mesenchymal stromal cells at the time. And a lot of different groups during that period showed that the, these cells were supportive of hematopoiesis. And then as they were culturing them in the culture dish, they uh, began to observe that these cells uh, served to be pre-osteoplastic and uh, could be turned into fat cells or adipocytes and chondrocytes. Um, and so that all kind of happened late 80s and the, in, into the 90s. And people got very excited about that. Um, and uh, to the point that in 1992, Jim Burns and Arnie Kaplan from uh, Case Western founded Osiris Thera Thera Therapeutics in Baltimore. And, uh, and this is really kind of the grandfather company of the MSC field and kind of started uh, the field off at the biotech industry level. And uh, uh, Dr. Kaplan is often um, uh, accredited uh, with termini uh, creating the term and the phrase mesenchymal stem cells. Um, and as we progress through this talk, you'll see that our understanding of these cells has progressed over the years. And, and more recently, he's uh, um, adjusted his, his nomenclature, keeping the same, same initials, but uh, now refers to them as medicinal signaling cells instead. And I'll, I'll tell you why in a, in a second. So mesenchymal stem stromal cells slash medicinal signaling cells, what are they, where are they found? Um, originally, as I mentioned, this whole field kind of originated in the bone marrow at first, um, but those cells within the bone marrow are, are very rare. Uh, their uh, frequency when you do a mononuclear isolate is somewhere in the order of one to 10 uh, to 1,000 to one to a million. So their frequency is, is, is quite low. And so you have to spend a lot of uh, time culture expanding them to get a, a reasonable number um, to establish a, a cell bank or, or utilize for therapeutic indications. And that actually made autologous um, bone marrow MSC therapy is kind of a challenge early on. Um, so after that was recognized and, and people realized 
and got excited about these cells as being the adult equivalent of embryonic cells, which they ended up not being. But at the time, that's where everybody's head was. Now, a lot of different people started looking for these cells in other tissues as well. Um, you see, uh, one of those founding pioneer uh, investigators uh, is, has joined us this morning, but Stu Williams and, and the group at the University of Pittsburgh uh, were really uh, foundational in characterizing the adipose-derived uh, stem stromal cells. And I spent uh, much of my career studying those cells along the way. But they and, and other groups uh, realized that these cells were much more frequent in adipose relative to bone marrow on the order of 1% to 10% of the nucleated cells that could be isolated from the adipose tissue. And then people went on to look at, uh, at these cells in um, other different tissues, birth tissues, umbilical cord, placenta, and found similar uh, levels of concentration. People looked in the blood, peripheral blood as well, um, and tried to use some cytokines to uh, increase the amount, but the amount of, of uh, MSCs that actually circulate within the blood uh, is, is really very quite, uh, very low, and it's uh, not a really an effective and efficacious way to um, isolate those cells for commercial use. So as, as Bob mentioned, at this point, we now understand that these uh, mesenchymal cells function to repair uh, and remodel disrupted vasculature uh, and remodel ECM, extracellular matrix. Uh, they can um, modulate, and they're particularly good at this, um, uh, immunomodulation. Um, and, they, and they play a role in, in cell turnover, especially within the bone marrow. So consistent with how Bob introduced uh, the topic in the field, within the MSC field, um, there was a historic uh, boom uh, in terms of people focusing in the area. And um, there have been greater than 88,000 publications uh, on mesenchymal uh, stem slash stromal cells over the years uh, with uh, 2021 being the peak publication year uh, and reporting 8,505 different publications. That's a lot of time, that's a lot of effort, that's a lot of NIH money and a lot of focus. And so uh, what, what have people done with that in the meantime? Well, the early years were spent focused really on determining how we could turn these cells into different tissue types in, in the culture dish, thinking that then when we transplanted the cells into uh, the body, that they would go on and, and form those tissue types there as well. So there was a, a huge uh, glo global surge of effort uh, trying to figure out how to, how to turn the cells into different mature cell phenotypes. Um, and then later, as time went on, uh, that shifted to other areas, which I'll, I'll talk more about later. But um, there was quite a bit of activity early uh, on, uh, just focusing on getting essentially the system set up, identifying it, characterizing it, understanding it, and figuring out what the potential ways that these cells could be um, increased in number to the point that they could be used for a therapeutic use at a, at a commercial and clinical scale. So after 30 years, how far have we come? This is a, a recent summary of where approved MSC uh, therapeutics stand within the world. Um, I found 10 different, um, uh, different MSC therapies uh, from nine different companies. And uh, as of today, there are no, or maybe one uh, approved MSC cell therapy after 30 years. So what went wrong? How come we're not <laughs> further ahead? Um, this is what I want to spend a little time on this morning. When I was at the Mayo Clinic in the first part of my career, Dr. Uh, Lawrence Riggs, who was uh, one of the founders of the Bone and Mineral Research Society and an endocrinologist, 
there used to always tell me, let the data speak to you, don't speak to the data. And I think one of the, the major challenges of our field is making some assumptions about what we expected these cells to do early on, and then spending a lot of time to figure out that that's not what they really do. So over the next uh, few slides, I want to spend some time going over what MSCs are and what they're not. Um, in other words, don't make assumptions. Let's look at the data. We'll talk a little bit about multiple mechanisms of action that are in play and the challenges that presents in terms of regulatory challenges. Uh, the regulatory system was designed to regulate single molecule, uh, small molecule chemicals and, and, and biologics. Um, wasn't really uh, thought of in terms of actually introducing whole cells beyond the transplant concept, which is regulated as a tissue uh, transplantation uh, regulatory pathway. And then finally, um, one of the major regulatory hurdles is establishing the relationship between what the cells actually do in clinical trials and ways to um, show that activity in a meaningful way uh, when you're manufacturing those cells uh, for lot release. And so all of those things um, had to be developed over these past 30 years. And there was a huge amount of, of tug back and forth, uh, both in terms of conversations being had between uh, the, the uh, blooming uh, biotech industry around the MSCs and, and the service providers that uh, provide the supplies and reagents to, to generate them, as well as, um, you know, the, the regulatory uh, conversations uh, that were had with the FDA who wasn't really set up to, to deal with these kinds of therapeutics. At the end of the 80s and, and during the 90s, when embryonic stem cells were being characterized, um, there was a great deal of, of buzz in the hematopoietic stem cell field had created this uh, lovely differentiation cascade. Um, and I think a lot of us early on when we first started differentiating these cells thought that the MSCs would just be uh, run in parallel to the HSC assumption that, that um, when we um, put these cells under the right conditions uh, that we could induce them to become uh, just about anything we wanted. And so during those, those first 10 years, in the uh, 90s to the mid 2000s, a lot of people focused their attention on, on setting up conditions and, and manufacturing uh, conditions to enable this concept of, of using these cells for mature tissue replacement. Uh, it makes a lot of sense for the, the bone marrow uh, uh, replacement um, to occur since that's where the original cells were observed to uh, spontaneously form some of these uh, phenotypes in the culture dish. And, and then people went on to, to show um, that other mesenchymal tissues were fairly easily uh, induced within culture. And then even later on, people were able to trick them into becoming uh, neurons and, and glial cells uh, and, uh, um, and liver cells, and pancre pancreatic uh, islet cells. Uh, to, to some extent. And so this is some early work uh, that is just a figure from an early paper that we did when I was at Satori Therapeutics, uh, where we had taken um, adipose-derived uh, stem cells or adipose MSCs. And there within our, our program, we were able to show that we could um, create both in vitro and in vivo in certain conditions, small amounts of bone, cartilage, fat, muscle, um, some, some cardiomyocyte uh, cells, blood vessel uh, and, and nerve cell formation. The problem was, is that when we went into all of our preclinical models and the majority of the group saw this, there wasn't robust, efficient differentiation into all these mature phenotypes. 
Um, another, another study that was done early on during that time period, uh, reported by Chen et al., um, looked at beta islet cell differentiation, which I know is a topic for, for this group. Um, and, and they used a rat model and used rat MSCs and were able to uh, culture them in a manner where uh, they showed upregulation of insulin, both uh, genetically and using radioamino assays. Um, they went on and looked at glucose regulation in diabetic rat models uh, and where they transplanted these uh, differentiated MSCs. And so that was very exciting. That set the stage for the possibility that uh, pancreatic islet cells could be um, obtained from these uh, cells. Uh, about the same time, however, uh, Yamanaka published his seminal work on the uh, um, development of induced pluripotent stem cells. And uh, within a few years, uh, the MSCs, uh, or, uh, became the stepchild and, and uh, everybody started focusing on the iPSCs to obtain mature cell phenotypes, which makes a lot of sense because that's really uh, the right kind of phenotype to, to develop those from. But nevertheless, MSCs were still shown, as, as Bob mentioned, lots of people have studied this, to play an essential role in helping establish uh, beta islet transplantation and, uh, but they, they did it in, in ways that weren't directly related to them turning into mature beta pancreatic islet cells. Uh, they have skills and capacities uh, beyond just turning into mature cell phenotype and especially providing immunoprotection and promoting uh, vascularization in and around those transplantation sites has proven to be quite valuable. And I'll show you some data about that. In, in a little, a uh, few slides down the road here. So as I mentioned a, a, a couple times, the other big challenge throughout um, the early 2000s was working with the FDA to um, create guidances and, and, uh, and a pathway forward for approval of these therapeutics um, that, that made sense because some of the, the concepts around what would be expected for a single molecule drug just don't work when you've got thousands of different proteins or nucleic acids or combinations of those biomolecules within a cell or even uh, from what the cell secretes, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, th these, these requirements just were very difficult to, to fulfill and achieve. And so um, there was a period of time where industry essentially had to kind of train FDA to what was what was realistic and what was what, what was not realistic. Um, for example, if you look at uh, biodistribution and PK and PD studies, uh, the cells, once you put them in the body, whether you inject them intravascularly or or uh, whether you direct injection inject them, uh, surprisingly, don't stick around very long. And when we first saw that back in the day, we, we were a little bit uh, befuddled and puzzled by that because of our initial concepts. But really, the majority of MSCs uh, are gone within the first week after, after you inject them, even when you directly inject them in, into sites. So here's two different uh, methods of, of tracking um, MSCs that have been injected into marine models and, and then using IBIS to detect them. And as you can see, uh, within a week, uh, there's not, not very much uh, signal left, regardless of, of the method used. And other methods have, have confirmed that, shown that. So what's going on? Well, shortly after people started to see this uh, uh, effect. I mean, we, we saw a lot of uh, effects of the cells still, even though they didn't turn into mature phenotype. We saw that, you know, they were capable of, of reducing inflammation. Um, and if you looked in culture, they, it, it was clear that they were changing the, the phenotypes of, of uh, the immune cells within inflammatory sites. Um, and, and conditions. Uh, they were 
really good at reducing apoptosis and, and uh, remodeling, inducing remodeling of, of fibrotic scar and tissue formation. And uh, collectively, all this stuff together supported tissue regeneration, but they, again, didn't seem to be doing that themselves. So there was some early work uh, done by a couple different labs led uh, by some some notables, and, and I just picked two out of the literature, but uh, Katrina LeBlanc and, and, and Keith March's groups both started to show that uh, MSC's uh, effects could be um, replicated just by using, collecting the conditioned media uh, from which the cells were grown in in vitro. Uh, which uh, created a whole whole new line of investigation focused on uh, the secretome of the cells and uh, the ECM that they that they produced and uh, what kind of role that actually was playing on the the host cells into which the cells uh, were injected or introduced. In 2010, um, Dr. Sai Kiang Lim in uh, Singapore and her team showed uh, some, some really pivotal work that established uh, the field of, of, of secretome biology and, and refined it further to understand that, uh, that an important component of the secreted uh, part of MSC efficacy is, is due to these small uh, vesicles that are secreted by the MSCs, referred to collectively as extracellular vesicles, uh, but specifically uh, as as exosomes, which is kind of the popular buzz term, just like uh, stem cells was back in the early 2000s these days. But she was able to isolate um, these exosomes and, and demonstrate in some uh, preclinical uh, infarct models, heart, heart disease models, that that the effect of, of the uh, MSC's exosomes was actually responsible for reducing the areas of damage after an infarct and, uh, and did that by comparing uh, the conditioned media alone with the purified uh, exosomes. And uh, a number of groups since then have, have opened up this field. So from 2010 on, really there was a transition and a focus uh, toward understanding better the, the secretome and how that um, plays a role in, in generating the, the efficacy of the MSCs. So just so that we're all on the same page in terms of nomenclature, the ISEV, the International Society of Extracellular Vesicles, uh, prefers the field to refer to uh, these vesicles as extracellular vesicles, as opposed to just exosomes, which traditionally by most people is considered uh, to be vesicles that are secreted from multivesicular bodies that are, are released uh, through uh, exocytosis in, in, and released from the cell. But there are other vesicles that butt off of the cell membrane um, and apoptotic bodies when cells undergo cell death also can form uh, vesicles. And depending on what your culture conditions are like, most of these therapeutics are a combination of, of all three of these things. And because there's overlap in terms of their size, so uh, exosomes range between 30 to 150 nanometers, microvesicles are between 100 to 1,000, and apoptotic bodies, uh, 100 to uh, 5,000 nanometers. It, it's difficult to distinguish those without doing some really in-depth um, analysis of, of protein content. And even then, uh, there's some overlap in terms of specificity of, of what's found on the surface of, a, of an exosome versus a microcellular vesicle versus an apoptotic body. So, are MSC exosomes the, the next wave of MSC therapy? Potentially, I think, I think yes. So a little bit more about, about exosomes and, and EVs, and I'm just gonna refer to e EVs collectively going forward. It doesn't mean electronic or electrical vehicles, it refers to extracellular vesicles in this case. Um, every cell in your body essentially uh, secretes 
these EVs. Um, the, they are used to communicate in a paracrine fashion between cells and coordinate tissue activity um, and system activity within your body. So the, the key true me mechanism of action for exosomes and extracellular vesicles is that they're communicators of, of biomolecules from one cell to another. And so you can think of them as, as billions of little messages in a bottle that float around through your body being picked up by different cells. And then those cells respond to those EVs and change what they're doing in response to the signals that they receive from them. And that provides an additional means of communication in addition to the soluble proteins that normally bind to the cell surface uh, on the receptors within the cell membrane. So one of the, the big issues that the field has to take on again is not making uh, global statements about exosomes and uh, extracellular vesicles like they did with the MSCs. People started to equate that everything is equivalent throughout the body and, and each MSC cell line, it was, was equal to each other and could do everything. Uh, and it was independent of tissue type. Well, there's lots of variables that contribute to the success and failure of, uh, of an MSC in terms of its ability to be potent or efficacious. And so each cell type within the body uh, creates EVs that contain uh, cell membranes with different proteins embedded with them or attached to them uh, on the outside. Uh, there's, there's RNAs, there's mRNAs and non-coding RNAs that are found within the EVs that play potential roles in signaling as well. And each EV, if you take each one individually, um, has kind of its own unique profile. And so what this ends up being, and not surprisingly to those of us in the MSC field all these years, is that it's, uh, it's just a, a, uh, another example of a, a system biology therapeutic approach. And so you have to throw a lot of these in combination to get the effect and each individual EV in and of itself may not do very much, but it's when you put them all together. Now, the other thing about this is each source of EVs, as I mentioned, is gonna have kind of its own unique kind of average composition. So it depends on what you wanna use them for as to where the, the best source of those EVs may come from. Just to show you an example of this, there's online, you can find some images of, of uh, extracellular vesicles um, using inferometric imaging uh, or interferometric imaging. Um, so it, because EVs are so small, you can't see them conventionally with uh, conventional light microscopy because they're smaller than the minimal visible wavelength of light. So you have to um, use some complex mathematical algorithms to uh, detect in individual spots, but th this, these kinds of methods are available now. Uh, and that's uh, an exciting development in the field to understand uh, what the variability is. But uh, you can see, depending on uh, the cell type that you get fr them from or, or um, the in vitro culture conditions that you might uh, get them from, um, that there are differences. And so understanding what the protein content and what the RNA content and what the lipid content of these EVs from these different sources are is really key to determining um, how they can be best utilized clinically, as well as um, how you're gonna develop your, your assays to analyze them and, and uh, produce them for commercial use. So um, again, I know this group is uh, interested in, in uh, the uh, pancreatic islet transplant space. So just wanted to bring up a, a recent study that was done in 2020 that looked at MSC-derived exosomes um, and uh, demonstrated that in terms of their ability to promote uh, survival of pancreatic islet cells uh, that and our beta islet cells, uh, that they were as effective at doing that in vitro um, as, as the MSCs themselves. So this is a, a live cell um, staining assay that shows in the presence of the MSCs that these uh, beta, beta islets um, 
were able to survive. Um, this is with the MSC uh, exosome isolate, and, and this is just conditioned media in which the exosomes have been spun out and removed. And, and you can see that there's, uh, there's clearly better survival uh, with the, with the uh, exosomes relative to the rest of the conditioned media, suggesting that there's important elements that promote um, survival of the pancreatic islet cells within the exosomes. Um, and the associated biomolecules that they that they carry, and to kind of back that up, uh, the same study uh, looked at uh, reduction of of uh, cell death and apoptosis, and again showed that. Uh, and so the the blue is DAPI, and the, the green in this case are cells that are dying. Uh, so it's a little bit opposite of that. Um, you can see that there's a clearly much more blue retained, whereas the condition media without the exosomes uh, was more comparable to the control. So this sets up an exciting future for us uh, because the exosomes then are in a position to uh, help fix some of the issues that we've had with the MSCs over the year. Um, so <laughs> One of the one of the things that we all got excited about about delivering cells um, into the body for for therapeutic treatment was the idea that once the cells were in there, they were going to respond to the environment and and just adjust and and, and fix the environment uh, by themselves. But some environments that you put the cells into are really hostile to the cells, and so it ends up killing the cells. And and so one of the advantages of taking the secretome. Uh, assuming that it has equivalent potency, is that the, you're not killing off cells. You can adjust the dose and deliver whatever you need without being worried about whether the cells live or die or not. Uh, secondly, um, exosomes and, and EVs are amenable to cold supply chain uh, or to being lyophilized uh, theoretically. And and, and some groups have now started to publish and show that lyophilized exosomes are as effective as, as the cells and, and uh, the frozen secret tome. Um, and, and so it addresses some of the key uh, issues of MSC manufacturing and shipping that have been problematic and expecting every, every hospital facility to have um, either minus 80 freezers or liquid nitrogen freezers. Um, as a result of that, there's better manufacturing scalability. So uh, you still need a lot of cells to create the EVs, but um, there, in some configurations, it's possible to uh, amp up the number of extracellular vesicles uh, being produced um, and still continue to use the same cells for a period of time. Whereas uh, MSCs by themselves are limited to how many you can obtain uh, and and their phenotype shifts over, over uh, passages of, of culture. And that's well known throughout the industry. And so um, using the EVs instead of the MSCs enables you to produce higher, higher concentrations of therapeutically relevant uh, uh, product or, or therapy and uh, uh, enables you to over, overcome some of the bigger challenges that have uh, been in front of MSC manufacturing. And I also think, and this is just my personal thought, is that, you know, the, the regulating uh, EVs as a complex biologic is somehow easier for the FDA to fit into their, their traditional algorithm. And so I think, I think uh, what you'll see is not another 30 years of development for these therapies, but some very rapid development um, to get these therapeutics out there. Uh, and hopefully uh, they won't experience the same level of frustration that the uh, traditional cell therapy manufacturers have had. So to conclude, I think the finish line is in sight. Um, there's a couple different companies. Agil uh, Therapeutics has started their first patient uh, dose in a phase one, two clinical trial to treat uh, burn wounds. Uh, a company, Direct Biologics, uh, recently announced that uh, their phase three, which was originally for COVID acute respiratory distress syndrome in severe COVID patients, um, has been converted to an all-cause uh, moderate to severe ARDS trial, which is really exciting for the field. Um, you can see that 
uh, scientific interest has, has peaked recently. There are 8,500 publications last year uh, in the MSC exosome space or in the, in the exosome space. Um, and so, and there's well over 50 to 75 different uh, companies out there now working on it. Uh, so uh, the potential of this to uh, serve as a next generation MSC therapeutic, I think is at this point undeniable and provides a really exciting future to finally get across that finish line. Um, at, at that point, I just wanna uh, thank you all for your time and attention and I'm happy to um, take any questions that you might have. Great, thank you, Kevin, for really a very interesting seminar. I think uh, as the field evolves in biology, it's always confusing because <laughs> you're dealing with all this phenomenology and it doesn't tell you step back and sort things out uh, that you know really what you're doing. And uh, I guess this is a lot of lessons learned. Um, uh, Peter Frost asked, and, and I think you've addressed it. Do you know why MSCs are important for islet transplant? I'm assuming your answer would be it's the uh, quote I had before about paracrine effects and uh, revascularization and repair. Yeah, I, th I think there is a reasonable amount of, of data uh, and evidence that suggests that the uh, ability for um, the MSCs to modify uh, the body's response against uh, small amounts of, of foreign cells or foreign tissue, or, or at least recognized that way, um, is, is one of the, the ways that the MSCs can help uh, islet transplantation, for example. Um, and so it, when you co-deliver the the islets with the MSCs, the MSCs kind of create an extracellular matrix shield um, that uh, can protect the cells uh, within the cluster and, and reduce the uh, amount of exposure of the immune cells, I think. Um, and there's probably some other ways as well. But um, I, I've, I've seen, seen several different uh, groups publish on the fact that that combination seems to be helpful. Okay, another question from Chris. Krisham is how can MSCs do, um, what can MSCs do and what are its comparative advantage compared to IPSCs? Yeah, so again, I think the IPSCs from a manufacturing, if your goal is to create beta islet cells for transplant, the IPSCs have, have the advantage over, over the MSCs just because you can perpetuate the cultures uh, so much better. Mm -hmm. uh, and so commercialization is, is feasible from that perspective. And the MSCs do different things, right? They're not, they're not as progenitor-like as the IPSCs are. Uh, they're more focused on um, secreting messages that promote revascularization and repair. And so these islet cells need to be connected to the host tissue. And so they can uh, provide a, a supporting role in terms of integrating the, the islets uh, into the host tissue, I think. Okay, uh, Safa Bahab, I'm saying, right? Apologize if I didn't. What about the heterogeneity of exosomes? I mean, you meant you showed that nice slide showing the different of, yeah, you know. so so that's that's the thing is that you have to find a way um, to to demonstrate that whatever it is that you're going to choose to uh, utilize as your therapeutic is both reproducible and and has a robust efficacy consistently uh, for each time you manufacture them. Um, as I talked about in the in the talk, each exosome individually is is different, but there's, but there's some things that are there consistently, right? I mean, you have to be able to identify these vesicles as microvesicles, and so there are there are certain things that are always always present that you can use to, as kind of a, a thumb indicator of of um, 
whether you've got the same thing or not. So the heterogeneity issue can be overcome, but it takes a little bit of time to figure that out. Okay. Um, um, Peter Frost asks, what's the impact of uh, Kodiak, is it Kodiak Biosciences bankruptcy for the market, cap for the market? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's unfortunate, right? I mean, every, each each industry uh, member wants to see, doesn't want the other companies to beat them out necessarily, but doesn't necessarily want to see them fail either, right? Because a win for the uh, a new industry, a burgeoning technology is is a win for everybody in a certain sense, and a loss is a loss. So, obviously, less educated people who don't understand the intricacies of of why things didn't work or or the challenges that they had in manufacturing are going to look at it and go well this is just like the msc's it's not going to work blah 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 but i mean kodiak had i i can't speak to to why why all that happened but i mean there there's some differences so there's kind of two sets of of um philosophies for using exosomes one are kind of naturally derived EVs that are just taken with not a lot of additional manipulation, whereas others are genetically engineered or, or protein engineered to, say, focus on being received by a particular organ or tissue or something like that. And, and those, those programs and those pathways are a little bit more challenging to, um, to uh, reproduce effectively commercially. And then also at the same time, um, in a sense, you're, you're, what you're doing when you're introducing a drug and using the EVs as a drug delivery tool is you're introducing a very ele elegant delivery system for a single molecule drug. And so the same sort of issues that you face in single molecule drug trials, and as we all know within pharma, what, 80%, 90% <laughs> of drug candidates fail, right? As somewhere yeah. along the way, it, it's the same sort of effect um, that can come into play when you're using the EVs as a therapeutic delivery tool. Hey, Roberto Gramagnoli asked, interesting overview. What is the current what currently is the best method to purify EVs? And my question mm. is, do you need to purify? I mean, what degree of purity do you need for EV? Yeah, I mean, so and and again, this is it depends on which philosophical camp you come from, right? I mean, from my perspective as a biologist, I think nature has done a great job of evolving the secreted proteins and, and vesicles that they need to address a problem. And so why are we going back and trying to re-engineer what millions of years or thousands of years, if you're a creationist, <laughs> uh, has, has put out there, right? And so so in, in a certain sense, I, I'm not sure that a whole lot of purification needs to be done once you establish that your product is safe. Um, it, I mean, right. it's, it's really a, it's really a regulatory issue and what people expect for products. And if we can get over that hurdle and, and come up with a, a new paradigm of, all right, as long as it's safe, you can have maybe slightly more variance than what we'd expect out of a single small molecule. Then I, I right. think that it's, it makes sense to look at the whole, whole secret home. Yeah. Adam Imelik asks, do exosomes provoke an immune response? Uh, individually, no, um, because each one has so little uh, protein on their surfaces that uh, there's not really enough to activate uh, an aggressive immune reaction, uh, at least at the doses that are currently being delivered by the industry. Yeah. And Stu Williams said, great talk, Kevin. Do MSCs have a specific... CD marker expression profile, and what about the exosome marker expression? Yeah, so um, it's it's variable, as Stu well knows, right? Adipose cells have slightly different CD marker expression than bone marrow MSCs. A lot of it has to do with um, time and culture versus what they had when they were initially isolated. Um, those profiles change in culture. For example, the adipose stem cells have quite high levels of CD34, which is typically considered to be a hematopoietic stem cell marker when you initially isolate them. But within one or two passages of culture from primary culture, all of that expression is gone. So um, there's, there's a number of different markers that may vary. Um, you know, if you look at 
whole proteomic and uh, secretomic expression profiles of exosomes and, and MSCs that they originate from. There's a lot of similarity between the, uh, the MSCs from different origins and locations, but there's, you know, it depends on the study that's being done, but anywhere between one to 10% of, of the protein profile expression can be different. So, um, you know, oh, and the RNA at, at the same time, I remember doing some early studies back in my Satori days that suggested adipose microRNA profiles were different than, um, than those from bone marrow. So, yeah. Okay. Wang Swing, uh, Sui said, thank you for your enlightening, enlightening presentation on MSC, your sense, your insights and experience in the field are truly invaluable. I have a couple of questions that I'd love your thoughts on. After talk, what would your be your primary message or recommendation to the FDA to further support the MSC field? That's his first question. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the conversation needs to continue about how to address the current regulations focused around analytics for lot release and stability testing of, of the cells and the EVs. Um, just because there's a hundred multiple mechanisms of action in play at, and some yeah. of them at very low levels that are very difficult to measure. And so what I'm excited about is with the advances of the AI technology and big data collection and spatial biology and things like that, I think we have the opportunity in the next five, 10 years to really hone in and figure that out because a lot of the solutions to that are bigger than an individual person's brain. So, um, you know, I, I think the potential is there to, to wrap all that together, but uh, I think ultimately the FDA needs to create a separate um, guidance uh, with industry uh, input uh, an academic input about what an acceptable alternative guidance would be for these complex secretome-based biologics, whether they're purified EVs or e EVs uh, and, and soluble um, proteins and, and soluble biomolecules. And I think you may have answered in your perspective, his sec bar was in your perspective, what do you see as the most significant hurdle or obstacle to the clinical application of MSCs? Yeah, I mean, really, I, I don't think it's safety anymore. I mean, I think with a thousand trials that have been, uh, you know, published uh, or not published, but uh, listed, uh, there's been enough clinical trials d done now that we know what the safety parameters are for for MSCs and, and the safety parameters for EVs is even more robust. So I, I don't think it's safety. I really think it comes down to developing a, a, a good story or a legitimate story, a rationale for, for what the, the products are doing and, what, and how that correlates clinically. The big, biggest issue traditionally seems to have been, uh, you know, you can't show us in vitro which lots are gonna fail and which ones are gonna work in the clinic based on your your in vitro potency relative to clinical efficacy and I, that still maintains to or is still still is one of the major hurdles of the field and so we need to continue to work with them on that another question uh, thank you for your presentation what are your general thoughts about ipsc derived msc's um not against them. <laughs> uh, I, I think, it, you know, it, it's fine. It makes sense. It, you know, it, as long as you can establish that, it, you know, as long as you have data that shows that the MSCs aren't somehow re-reverting to a earlier phase, which could pose some sort of safety threat. You know, I mean, always the issue has been with the ESLs about teratoma formation or, or things like that or causing right unsolicited proliferative effect on some dormant cancer cells or something. So if you've got the safety data and the, the reproducible correlative characterization data for the cells, it, it, it makes sense. I mean, they, you can sustain those for indefinite periods of time and, and traditional MSCs do have a, a, a finite life, even though it can be extended under certain culture conditions for a while. Um, another question, uh, 
Is there any possibility that current drawbacks of mammalian exosomes overcome are overcome by plant-derived exosomes? <laughs> um, in theory, yes. It, 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 depends on, it depends on what the mechanisms of action are required right. to resolve the disease, right? Some things are going to be conserved across cells. So if it's a basic cell mechanism of action that's uh, out of whack, you may be able to use plant-derived uh, exosomes and their molecular contents to, to mitigate that. I mean, certainly um, traditional medicine doctors have been taking advantage of that fact for thousands of years, mm -hmm. right? So it's possible. And, okay. And what is the, the ideal disease indica indica disease slash indication target for MSCs and EVs? What has not been tackled yet? No, that's a great question. You know, uh, a lot of a lot of things have been tried, um, and and a, and most things have probably been tackled at the preclinical level in a certain sense. I think the general take home for MSC EVs is that they're really good at modifying immune cells and bringing them back to a level of activity that is within the normal range of operations. So, uh, you know, the work that's been published and, and reported on resolution of cytokine storm during the, uh, the COVID uh, patient uh, trials, I, I think is supportive of that. And there's, there's an abundant literature now uh, showing uh, an immunoregulatory capacity of the MSCs that it's very consistent from group to group and even, even growing and using different kinds of media. Um, but uh, in, in general, I think any sort of disease which requires a, a reset of the immune system has potential to be uh, utilized by MSCs. Um, can they be turned into bone, fat, cartilage in, in those uh, microenvironments? Um, maybe the question is, is how effectively uh, and how efficaciously that is. I, I think their role as people go on and on with this, uh, uncover it more, it's more about regulating how the host uh, tissue and uh, surrounding tissue is behaving um, than it is actually what the cells themselves do to become mature cells. I don't think typically that's the major mechanism of action. Uh, um, question I have is in, in all of these things, the exosomes, extracellular vesicles, whatever, all contribute a positive effect. There's never a, a um, I mean, the, inverse, the in, inflammatory versus the healing spectrum, so to speak. Yeah, it, it, I think it's an unknown question, right? I mean, because the compl what what has been shown convincingly is is safety profile. So whatever inhibitory effect that is there. Um, doesn't seem to be adversely affecting patients when they receive it. Having said that, I mean, there certainly could be things you'd want to take out and purify and enrich or change cultured media right. conditions uh, or purification methods to get rid of some of those inhibitors. And I think I think that's, that's possible too. I mean, the, the thing I'm excited to get to someday is I think there's going to be combinations of different EVs from different cell right. sources that collectively can have a, a more robust effect than any one cell derived type by themselves. Okay. Um, what would be the amount of MSCs in the pancreas? I think. Uh, uh, well, I mean, it's it's dependent on the uh, amount of vascularity, right? Because MSCs, say, yeah. yeah, MSCs naturally are are around all the microvasculature. So the more vascularized the tissue, the more MSCs there are. And does the MSC media uh, have an impact on exosome number and functionality? Uh, oh, for, for sure. In other words, just, can you get a media that stimulates exosomes? I yeah, yeah, of course. Um, there, there are certain factors that will um, upregulate the amount of uh, multivesicular body formation and, and secretion of, of MSCs. And so you can pump that into the media. I mean, there may be combinations of, of media components, uh, certain amino acids uh, that, that could also upregulate 
um, the EVs. Again, the important thing is not about the number of EVs, it's about the biomolecules that are within them, right? So that's, right. that's really the thing. And so, uh, you know, you can play around with different medias and show different numbers of EVs, but the relevance of that to clinical efficacy has to be proven. Okay, we'll end up with a last question from Stu Williams. Any thoughts on the route of EV delivery intravascular and how do EVs find their target? Hmm. I, I don't know that the EVs find their target. I think their targets find them. Um, so, I mean, most, most EVs are taken up by cells that are capable of rapid, uh, you know, membrane vesicle uptake. So uh, endothelial cells uh, um, are most likely in an IV route, right? They're exposed and then peripheral and circulating mononuclear cells and, and any cells that are rapidly phagocytizing or en endocytically uptaking surrounding um, bits of, of lipid uh, are, are really the cells that are gonna win out in that battle. I mean, there are people that are programming different um, proteins on the surface of the EVs to try to get them to stick uh, better, or when the, they encounter a certain cell type or tissue type, that they'll they'll hang out there longer. But but really, I mean, if you throw it into the circulation, it's kind of a, a random chance thing. They don't have any motility on their own accord, right? It's kind of wherever they they end up. So, okay. Well, thank you, Kevin. We've we've uh, had some great discussion and really a superb superb. A webinar on this topic. Great. And I learned a lot. And um, just the, the participants who are still on, if you can, fill out the polls. Also, uh, if you have any suggestions for future webinars, uh, please just contact me directly at Vitacite, RC McCarthy at Vitacite.com. And I wish you all to have a great day. And again, thank you, Kevin, for a superb presentation. Thanks a lot, Bob. Yeah, take care. Thank you.